Okay, well, uh, I hope you have the patience to listen to this sort of lower level, not yet sublime presentation. Um, but I I'll go ahead anyway. It's more material here. Oh, thank you. Okay, more material. Uh, this paper is part of an ongoing study of land use changes in the border region that includes Sichuan Bana, known as Sipsong Bana in Thai Prefecture, in uh, the, the border region including Sichuan Bana Prefecture in Thailand and Northern Thailand, Northern Laos, and Northern Thailand. Uh, Jeff Fox, who is one of the principal investigators, and Yayoi Fujita, who is also somewhere in this audience, are both part of the project and will be talking about different aspects of what we're looking at. The project is funded through grants uh, from NSF and NASA, and the objective is to evaluate the dynamics of change in this region. We have the border region, Myanmar, Laos, and Northern Thailand down here. Uh, at a time when China and Laos are both going through e economic reform, China has entered the WTO. There's a recent free trade agreement between the three countries and a construction of an all-weather road linking the three countries and the region. The presentation I'm giving today draws on parts of a more comprehensive study that has been carried out together with Janet Sturgeon at Simon Fraser in Vancouver in which Janet and I have been trying to look at the narratives of the different actors involved in the rubber and tea sectors in Sichuan Bana. Both sectors are dominated by large, extensive monocrop plantations. And we're trying to get at, through the narratives, get at how people are making decisions about securing and improving their livelihoods in response to the changing economic, political, and social dynamics. We're finding that the actions of people in this area are challenging long entrenched categories of modern and advanced, and categories that have been associated with land and forest management in the discourse of development in China. Today, I will be focusing on the practice of growing tea under the forest canopy. Rubber is a whole lengthy and very interesting story in its own right, um, but I'll talk about the practice of growing tea under the forest canopy, a practice that was formally ignored and dismissed as backward and which has now been recast as a marketable niche product. And the growers of this product have shown themselves, in fact, to be far more attuned to the subtleties of global marketing than the official planners and development agencies who are, in principle, leading these backward minorities into the modern world. To begin with, uh, a little background is needed about the state and land use policies in Sichuan Bana. Over the last 50 years or so, the landscape of Sichuan Bana Prefecture has been transformed from a mosaic of tropical forest, paddy rice, and swidden cultivation in, yeah, that's it, uh, to extensive tracts of cash crop plantations, mostly rubber, and also tea. In the history of that transformation, the state has played a major role in advancing its vision of what is modern, which consists essentially of large-scale plantation of cash crops. Rubber and tea are probably the two most important cash crops in Sichuan Bana. The, the state has taken its interest and has pursued uh, the extension of these crops in the area for the last 50 years or so, most notably by establishing 10 state farms between the years of 1955 and 1982. Nine of these state farms produce mostly rubber, while the 10th produces mostly tea. The decision to introduce rubber into the area was made at the highest level of government, the Central Committee in Beijing, during the Korean War for strategic reasons, in order to provide a supply within China at a time of trade blockade uh, to pursue the war in Korea. Since the 1950s, uh, strategic and ideological considerations have continued to shape who grows a crop, where, and how. While the state was orchestrating the introduction of an agronomic research into rubber, a new, which is itself a new and inherently industrial crop, they were also carrying out the same kind of research, extension, and introduction of tea, which, curiously, is a product with, in fact, a long and distinguished history in Sichuan Bana, not a new product, and not inherently industrial. Tea has been the target of official efforts to apply science and technology to increase production in order to promote development and transform society. The planners and technical agencies responsible for this task have always seen tea as a crop that should be grown, as here, densely planted in monocrops on terraces to create the terraces 
requires in official intervention to mobilize villagers and to teach them how to build terraces, something they've actually been doing for millennia, and to teach them scientific planting techniques, such as the selection of high-yielding varieties, correct pruning, use of fertilizers and pesticides. This has continued over the last decade or so, as the local branch, the prefecture branch of the central government's Poverty Alleviation Bureau has been the primary source of investment targeted in concert with another program uh, at a national basis which tries to reforest sloping land. You may have heard of the logging ban and there are a series of policies associated with the logging ban to reforest extensive areas of South China. The two agencies together have consistently or even doggedly pursued a strategy for development that moves farmers from what the agencies believe to be backward unscientific practices to officially sanctioned modern scientific large-scale production. The official landscapes that come out of this support and uh, encouragement from the Poverty Alleviation Bureau and Forest Bureau are composed of extensive tracts of intensively cultivated tea. Though there are still some areas at high elevations where you see a diverse patchwork of crops, including these gardens of old scattered tea trees that have been grown for generations under the forest canopy. Until very recently, the existence and the history of this forest tea, which is often known as ancient forest tea, has been invisible to, or more properly, deliberately erased by the government agencies responsible for land use planning and poverty alleviation. Over the last five years, however, urban and international demand for rare and high quality teas has soared, creating markets both domestically and as here internationally for this tea which now is no longer a backward product that some minorities in the mountains plant, but it's now a product that is organic. It has an aura of history, cultural or ethnic authenticity. A little Pete's Coffee's blurb I have highlighted in blue. To start then on a little background on the environmental and social history of tea in Sichuanbana. Most of the tea produced in China is the Camellia sinensis, otherwise known as small leaf tea. In Sichuanbana, however, and in other regions of southwestern Yunnan, uh, the tea that is planted and processed is big leaf tea, Camellia assamica. Big leaf tea has a flavor that is closer to the flavor of tea produced in India, and so has, a, has always had a somewhat different cachet in China as a slightly different kind of tea. Historians of tea consider that what is now known as puar tea, and places like Pete's Coffee and elsewhere sell it as puar tea, that puar tea originally comes from a region of southeastern Sichuanbana, which is referred to as the six ancient tea mountains, the area that just came up in blue. In the documented historical records, the first references to tea trade in Sichuanbana date from as early as 1398. The high point of production seems to have been during the middle to late Qing dynasty, about the 17th, 18th centuries. At that time, there are known to have been several tens of thousands of laborers working uh, in the tea plantations and tea uh, industry in this area. Uh, the tea trade at that time collapsed after a period of warfare and revolution, uh, and the trade uh, fell apart, the trade routes broke down, and the uh, people who had been laboring there left. The central government of China became interested and involved in tea production again before the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. The Kuomintang government in the 1930s uh, began to look at the potential of this area for production for what was already then a state-owned tea company. By the end of 1940, there was already a research station with 20, 21 people who had been brought there from Kunming, the provincial capital, uh, to set up a tea factory at Nan Noshan, which is way up in one of the mountains in the area. Uh, the research station still stands, although it's now used mostly as a stable. After the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, Monghai, which is over on this side of pre the prefecture, if we can remember the, the map, uh, more towards Myanmar. After the founding of the People's Republic, Monghai became the center of an experimental area for tea cultivation including one of the large state farms. At the time, during the collective period, state farms and uh, the production brigades in the communes 
had to meet production targets and quotas that were set by the state plan. The large-scale plantation model of tea production dominated, of course, through the collective period in the communes, but even as late as the mid-1980s, well after the period of reforms had begun, the period that has been shifting more uh, to private production and private farms again, as late as the mid-1980s, a large area, 10,000 more, 625 hectares of what had been labeled as wasteland in northern Sichuanbana was turned into this plantation, the Dadugang tea plantation. In other parts of the prefecture, throughout the 1990s and into the present, as I said earlier, the Poverty Alleviation Bureau has been channeling government funds to establish tea plantations in villages with incomes below the poverty line. Nearly all of these villages are villages inhabited by minority, ethnic minority communities. So tea production came very much to mean terrace monocultures, densely planted bushes, uh, pruned to waist height for picking. Things changed or began to change in the mid-1990s. Uh, a little story uh, told by a local historian of tea gives uh, some insight into how this rediscovery of forest tea happened. In August 1994, the head of the China Tea Research Institute held a conference on China's tea culture. Some researchers from Taiwan wanted to visit the original tea mountains. People told them not to bother because the only real Pu'er tea comes from Pu'er itself in a different prefecture. The Taiwanese said that they had read in old texts that the best tea came from southeast of Pu'er. Officials in Jinghong, the prefecture capital, told them not to bother going to the tea mountains because there's nothing there anymore. But the Taiwanese insisted and said they wanted to go. Once they got to Iwu, they saw what we were still doing there. They talked to me, and I told them what I know about the old methods of planting and processing. They were very excited and wrote reports about what they'd seen. And what they had seen were these tea gardens under the forest canopy. Uh, this ancient forest tea grows on individually managed plots under the forest canopy, generally at elevations of above 1,000 meters in these ethnic minority areas. Some of the tea trees may be naturally occurring as wild trees. Others appear to be enrichment plantings using seedlings from natural regeneration. I think it's important in the context of this meeting that nobody really knows and nobody actually cares whether or not these are wild trees or replanted. The point is, in terms of the way it's grown, that it is grown under the forest canopy. Trees are pruned annually. Sometimes there are some openings made in the forest canopy to get some 20 to 30 percent of forest cover, which gives the ideal amount of light. Interestingly, the tea gardens are not formally marked out in the forest, but families each recognize their own plots, which can be inherited or alienated. Contiguous plots in one area can be quite extensive, up to 1,000 more, 62 hectares or so. Rights to the plots are not legally recognized, but are recognized and respected in practice. In fact, even during the period of the communes, when all production was supposed to be collective and collectively managed, uh, people still found that they were able to have their plot of land allocated to their family to manage on behalf of the commune. And when the communes were broken up, they got that land back. At the time that the Taiwanese specialists rediscovered forest tea, uh, one pressed tea cake, which is the way the tea is pre uh, processed, 350 grams or so, had a price of seven yuan, which is at the time was about 50 cents, US cents. By early 2007, the average price of one kilo of forest tea had reached a peak of 1,200 yuan and one cake of particularly fine, well-aged tea could fetch as much as 3,000 yuan. People were investing in buying tea cakes in order to be able to pay for their children's education in the future when they could resell it. The neat, legible, highly productive terraces uh, of tea remain the preferred landscape of the officials. At the same time, Demand in domestic and international markets is clearly moving rapidly away from the bulk or blended reds that are uh, from this area. In 2006, officials responsible for agricultural planning, rural development, and poverty alleviation, thanks, <laughs> uh, continued to plan for the extension of forest tea, assuming without question that market demand would continue to rise and absorb all the tea that they could produce from the terraces. 
In 2007, however, overproduction finally caught up with them. The prices for poor tea collapsed. It's interesting to note, though, in terms of the, uh, the business acumen and the awareness of markets of the backward minorities, that while the price of tea across the board collapsed, if you do the calculation, the price of forest tea dropped by about 50%, while the price of terrace tea dropped by more like 70%. Uh, so it was still a better uh, investment to keep growing the forest tea. The sale of forest tea has become very closely associated, as we saw from the Pete's Coffee advertisement, with a whole vocabulary and a whole vision of ethnicity, of authenticity, and sustainability. These are all, interestingly and ironically, terms that essentially have been used in the past as critiques of the backwardness of minority people, that they were too rooted in their tradition, that uh, they were not transforming nature in order to progress. And in the meantime, uh, people who used to be involved in the, uh, sorry, this is gonna be a little confused, I've got to catch up with the time. The people who had been involved in planning and extending the terrace tea now find themselves in many cases after their retirement as they step back from their official roles stepping back into their roles of people within an ethnic minority community in their village. Some of them, party secretaries, retired party secretaries, have now moved into the business. Uh, this is in one, one family, person who's retired, former party secretary, is now producing 10 different varieties of forest tea. Uh, he sells to people who come directly to him from Taiwan and Hong Kong, sells through these kind of informal negotiations in a courtyard that he's recreated uh, in a, a sort of neo-imperial style that fits this historical vision of what the tea really should be. Uh, interestingly though, at the same time, these same people are seeing possibilities for extending ancient systems of growing tea. So taking the new terraces, uh, that have been promoted by the Poverty Alleviation Bureau and others, now that there's a little less control over what is done on farming, people like the entrepreneur we just seen a picture of have started to go back to the terraces. They started to thin out the very densely planted terraces. They started to allow some of the waist high trees to grow up higher in order to recreate a little more of the ancient forest tea, which they know very well is going to market better than the terrace tea. In conclusion, for all tea growers in Sichuan Bana, marketable now means competitive in a global market. Competitive means that which distinguishes one product from others. In an ironic reversal, what distinguishes Sichuan Bana tea from others are its historical and its cultural attributes. The same attributes that had once made forest tea production backward and something to be reversed by creating terraces and planting scientific tea, scientific terrace tea, these same qualities and attributes have made forest tea production authentic, and to use the words of the Pete's Coffee advertisement, far above the usual quality, uh, a product for which there is high demand in international markets. So natural, traditional, and indigenous qualities that used to be associated with backward and low quality are now the very qualities for which buyers from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and elsewhere will be paying a premium. Ironically, entry into the world market has transformed the backward minorities of the six ancient tree mountains, six ancient tea mountains, sorry, into entrepreneurs who are now defining the cutting edge of green marketing in this border region. Thank you. <laughs> This question of uh, food, elite food items and their marketing is, ex I think, extremely important. Certainly, those of us who work in Central America see this a lot with the questions of, of coffee and the transformations in coffee uh, production from uh, uh, sun coffee to an emergence and urgency about getting back this stuff under trees so it can go into the biodiversity-friendly market. So one of the things is these 
processes are much more extensive. I think we often think that elite food products are you know, just like little amounts, but they can cover many millions and millions of hectares of areas that go into more forest cover. As I mentioned, just in one village, the, if you put the various small plots of forest tea together in one village, it came to about 1,000 more, 60 or more hectares just for one village. And that is contiguous. The plots are all in the forest. Uh, Rod Newman. Um, I don't know if I missed it on the uh, Pete's website or, or not. Is there a certification process or is there a third party certified shade grown? And yes. if so, what is that doing to sort of local economies and local land uses and who's involved in the community in this sort of yeah. uh, shade grown tea? The Pete's Coffee are definitely selling uh, forest tea that has been through the international fair trade certification procedure. It's got the little fair trade badge down at the bottom of the advertisement. But the whole issue of authenticity is coming up in, in this different guise. It's one thing to be authentic and uh, come from the forest up in the mountain. It's another thing to prove that this block of tea that is on sale in Kunming or somewhere is authentically a block of ancient forest tea. And uh, it is turning out to be one of the big issues. Uh, there are certification agencies that are looking to getting into this market. As we know, there are competing certification agencies internationally. Uh, there's a, attempts on the part of the provincial and national authorities to try and develop certification systems. Uh, they're not very highly regarded because, as with so many places, there's very little confidence in the uh, in the incorruptibility of the agencies that are meant to do it. Within villages, what seems to be, again, the cutting edge of the green marketing, um, and I may be projecting a little uh, ahead of what might be happening now that the price has dropped so significantly, but uh, two years ago, you were beginning to see uh, small collectives or cooperatives emerging, which were deliberately nothing like the collectible cooperatives of the commune period. People have been through that, they've been inoculated, vaccinated against that procedure. What they were trying to do was bring together uh, their production into one place where the Taiwanese or Hong Kong or other buyers could come and uh, could be fairly sure that the tea that was being sold there would be the authentic tea. So there were some small cooperatives building where it would still be each family's produce wrapped up in the traditional way with their own mark on it, but where there was one kind of marketing group that then tried to get this through. Uh, since all these people are scattered in the mountains, it saved the buyers, of course, the difficulty of going up into the mountains, and it tried, they were trying at least by doing this, to still retain the individuality and the authenticity of this family production while trying to get into the bigger markets. But this was beginning to happen two years ago at a time when the boom was at its highest. I haven't been back since the market price has dropped, so I don't know how that might have affected these moves. Uh, Robin Sears from the School for Field Studies. Nick, thanks for the, yeah. the talk and the good story. Um, my question is, uh, are the traditional growers changing their production processes or, or management? Um, practices in response to the to the success of, in the market? There, there's a lot of debate between the traditional growers themselves. Uh, the market was booming at any rate, and so they were looking at ways to increase production. One way was, as I described right at the end, taking the terrace tea and then modifying that so that it's closer to the forest tea production. People who were doing that were quite clear that that would be different. It wasn't going to be quite old forest tea, but they figured they'd be able to sell it better than the terrace tea. They're not using pesticides on it anymore. Uh, they find that by doing the pruning and keeping it more widely spaced, there's less problems with disease and fungus and so on, which are very problematic in the scientific tea. Um, but there's a, another kind of activity going on, which is to deliberately try to recreate forest. 
Um, there's, the, there's claims that there was a traditional technique uh, when there was some forest disturbance or a hole in the forest, that there were techniques by which they could encourage the forest trees to grow up again um, and encourage the tea then to grow up under the trees. What is much more controversial is to increase production. Some people have been trying to prune the forest trees to increase the canopy. They feel it's about uh, to decrease the canopy. They feel 20 to 30 percent forest cover is the ideal in terms of the light. And so some people have been experimenting to make it easier to harvest the tea, to try and coppice some of the, t the bushes, uh, to open up the canopy a little more. But this is very, very controversial. And people within a village would say, they're doing that. But over on our side, we're not doing this. And it'll be interesting, I think, to see how that works, because these are contiguous plots in the same area of forest. And you would expect that the, if Mr. Wang is doing it in one place and Mr. Meng next door doesn't want to do it, there may well be some conflicts. But it was just starting, and uh, people are experimenting, and we'll see where it goes. I think, yeah. Okay, this will think, be our, yeah. we, we have, and then we'll, we'll be, okay. uh, we'll end uh, our. Uh, Mahesh Shangarajan, uh, uh, Delhi tea, University, a uh, question, Nick, very simple. Does, does it make sense to draw a line between the forest and the tea if it's forest trees? Because you showed forest trees mm -hmm. growing where the tea is, and tea being grown where the forest is. And if there is a line, who owns that forest? You know, you said people yeah. own certain plots, but the forest as a whole, was it community owned or was it state owned? Well, we could get into a three-hour discussion about uh, land use and forest use rights in China. <laughs> to go to you at the first part of your question, um, the distinction is not being made. And that's, that's kind of the selling point um, in the inter international markets as well, as well. This is tea that comes out of the forest. Uh, the distinction is being made between that tea and the terrace tea. And there, I think, there is enough reason to say there's, there's a reason. In terms of the ownership, uh, I don't think it's an extremely complicated question. I think the best answer is that in terms of using and managing a particular piece of that forest tea, uh, it clearly is something that has very long roots. And there is a sense that one family manages one section of that forest. If they were even able to keep managing that same section during the Cultural Revolution, I think that's a pretty strong indicator that these these senses of a right to manage, at any rate, are very, very strong. Yeah. That actually, uh, this, I'm Chris Boyer from University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, that actually raises, though, the question of what's the role of the state, and particularly state experts in all of this. Uh, oftentimes, it's a very hard time to get, you have a hard time getting mm -hmm. agronomists who are employees of the state to want to move away from straight lines and monocultures into this sort of uh, uh, foresty looking mm -hmm. uh, and certainly not very straight uh, tea. So I'm sort of interested yeah. in, in how, how, has, how has the state responded to this? <laughs> um, there is actually a part of this project, too, where we're looking particularly at uh, development by decree, as it were, development by the government. And it's actually been very interesting that uh, while the development people at prefect prefecture government will talk on the one hand about this wonderful new entry into international markets and how important it is that this forest tea is now being sold, they will also talk about the environmental benefits because this is part of the discourse now. Then the next sentence when you ask them, and you know, as prefecture employees thinking about the future and development here, you know, what do your plans look like for the future? Well, then it becomes, well, we've got to extend the tea plantations, we've got to do this scientifically, and you're back in the old discourse. Basically, in terms of the old ancient forest tea, the government is watching what's going on. And there's plans happening, they're talking about doing this and the other, and meanwhile, the backward, the cutting edge, are moving right ahead and leaving the, the, the government and the state uh, uh, planning people way behind. We should, you we're running terribly behind. So Alan, if you don't mind. We can talk Alan, over coffee talk maybe. Just very brief. Alan Granger, um, I just wanted to say that um, your paper and Michael's about Amazonia earlier uh, really raise important questions about uh, biogeography. 
-hmm. About 15, 20 years ago, Ian Simmons uh, wrote a very pioneering book on called Cultural Biogeography. Mm -hmm. And what, what you've done is, say, is to say, well, the boundaries between agriculture and agroforestry yeah. are becoming very blurred, yeah. and also between agroforestry and forestry. And when yeah. we're coming to working out how much forest there is in the world, uh, it makes oh, it very absolutely. difficult. Absolutely. I think actually, again, in our project, Jeff, whenever Jeff is doing, Jeff is on the GIS bit of the project and has had a terrible time trying to figure out in this area what is forest, what is not forest. And so we'll be talking to that issue, and it's absolutely true. Yeah. Okay, time for tea.